You're old. You're irrelevant. <laughs> I didn't really want to be around him. How did you actually meet Michael Jackson? Who'd you come back with? What'd you do? No, nah, there's, there's a story which you can't tell. How much it was? A thousand dollars a day, seven days a week. Wow. I think I had more friends than Michael Jackson. Prince Charles and Princess Diana are going to be here. You've been impressed, right? And Mike, this is talking big money here. That's a lot of shit. Because I had fired in London. How real was this moment? Michael Jackson is the world's most famous person of the 21st century. I've been always curious to know what his life was really like during the peak of his fame. In order to find the best answer to that question, I've met with his personal photographer, Sam Emerson, who worked for Michael Jackson during 10 years. He captured the most iconic moments of Jackson's career, which we're going to discuss in my upcoming interview. Enjoy watching. <sighs> hey everyone. This is the time that I was waiting for a long, long, long uh, months. And finally, we are here in Chicago with the legendary, iconic photographer, personal photographer, Michael Jackson and Elton John, Mr. Sam Emerson. Welcome to Chicago. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure. I'm not sure about how iconic or how legendary. I think iconic. I'm more than confident about this. I think you usually say it's a legend in your own mind. Cheers. When is the last time you've been in Chicago? I was probably with Michael, and I can't remember what year the tour was. Probably the Victory Tour was 84. Then we probably came back here in 88 on the bad tour. How was the city after the 85? It's already, what, like 45 years past? It's been 40 years and a lot of bottles of wine, so I don't remember the city at all. <laughs> Except I do remember walking around around Chicago. We also did movies here, so I remember the river and shooting on the river and shooting on the bridges. Photography. When did you start to do the photography? How old you were? I wanted to be a photographer ever since I was in elementary school. That was, that was my dream. I wanted to be a photographer. I got a camera. I shot pictures. My father never developed them, but I still shot them. And then when I got to college, I bought a camera and just started taking pictures around the college. And I just got into it. And then I saw a group on TV called the Buffalo Springfield. And I went, I'm going, I told my friends, I said, I'm going to Hollywood, going to California. I'm going to be a rock and roll photographer. And they all kind of laughed. So that summer I left school unbeknownst to my father, and uh, started shooting pictures. Going to concerts, going to the whiskey, taking pictures. First big break was probably Altamont in 1969. That was a Rolling Stones free show. So after that, I was, I was in the front row. Uh, I got there very early. Uh, a really famous photographer, a famous photographer, Jim Marshall, they were going to kick me out of the front. But Jim Marshall said, oh, no, he's got Leicas. Let him stay in the front. He's professional. So thanks to Jim, I had my first big break. Hmm. So let's go back in time and let's pretend that I'm the photographer back in, let's say, 1970. 70. And I want to do a pictures of the icons of the music. There is no Internet. There is no Facebook. There is no social media. What is the way to become the photographer who does the pictures, for example, like for Elton John and Michael Jackson? Well, I started off by shooting, uh, we had a small studio. I started off shooting, the first thing was Altamont. So that gave me a break into a lot of magazines and newspapers. So then you have those credits. Then you can go to the record company, publicist, and go, listen, I know so-and-so is in town. We'd like to photograph him. And he goes, sure, that's fine. I mean, and then I started shooting the parties, which means I got to go know the bands better. But I shot, kept shooting uh, concerts and getting more and more you know, credits and so on and so forth, meeting more people. And the more credits you got, the more people you met. 
So pretty much it worked the same way as nowadays. Like if you do a picture like for some famous person, right? Doesn't mean that it should be like an artist, a singer, maybe like a sport, sports guy or like some like other celebrity. And they tag you on Instagram so other people can see you. That worked the same way, but only with the magazines, right? It works the same way it did with magazines or newspapers. But in those days you had to take the newspapers around and show them to the public. With you. Right. So it's like a portfolio. So if you have been published in a newspaper, like your photo have been published, and there is like a little description that Sam Emerson did this picture, how people can find you, even if they want to hire you, without the internet back in the days? Are they reaching out to a newspaper and they ask for the contact information? No, well, every, every record company had a publicist. Everyone had an office in Los Angeles. So everyone knows who you are. Mm -hmm. Not that hard. OK. <sighs> Let's talk about your experience of being part of Michael Jackson's career. Mm. And I would love to start with, how did you actually meet Michael Jackson? Well, the first time I met the Jackson brothers, we were in, I think, probably Detroit, maybe. I was with the Osmond brothers, which none of your Instagram buddies will know. But we uh, was with the Osmonds on tour. And Bill Samoth was like the tour manager. And he said, oh, Sam, the Jackson brothers, Jackson Five are downstairs in the same hotel. Let's go down and get a picture. So I went with the Osmonds. We got them all lined up, took the picture. And because I was rushed, because I was in my room and then rushed and grabbed my camera and went down, uh, there was no film of the camera. So basically, that exciting shot of the Jackson Five and the Osmonds, which would have been really huge, Never existed. Wow. But then after that, the Jacksons moved uh, from Motown to, to Encino. And I was working for some teen magazines at the time. So we did the first photo shoot with the brothers and with Michael. That was the first uh, connection there on the West Coast. And then I would be, I would shoot parties and, and awards things, conventions, CBS conventions. Michael would be getting awards, Michael would be up the stage, and so I photographed him there, photographed him there and said hello. And then Billie Jean video came along, and Epic, Sony, Columbia, whichever, uh, called me and said, we want you to shoot this video. So I covered the video and did a great job. Michael loved the shots. He asked for dupes on every, of every image, which he has more than I have. And then, um, where was I? 1984, I'd already finished the Elton tour. And in 84, I was in Paris with my son and a friend from England, watching the Tour de France, and got a call from my then girlfriend saying, I've got good news. I said, what's the news? She goes, oh, Michael Jackson wants you to fly back and join the Victory Tour. They're not happy with their photographer and want you to come back and do it. But before we're going to go to the Victory Tour, I want to have, I have a little question about the Billie Jean music video shoot. That's after the Victory Tour. There was, there was... No, no, actually Billie Jean was before. You're before, right. okay. Ah, there's a funny story about that. So, at that time, Michael's manager was Wisner Demand, Ron Wisner and uh, demand. And so we were backstage with Michael and there's all these shoes lined up in the, in the dressing room. Freddie DeMann was his other manager. And so Michael said, I want to wear these shoes. He said, I'm going to wear these. They were all white. Freddie said, no, I'm not going to wear those. You need to wear those with the black, with the black toes. You're going to be on white squares. They're going to light up. You want to be able to see how your feet move. So Michael acquiesced, not charmed, but he did it, and he wore the shoes, and that way you can see how his feet move on the light, rather than just an all-white shoe, which may have disappeared. So they needed to have a contrast, obviously. Hmm? They needed to have a contrast on those white yes, yeah, panels. Yes, absolutely, right. Let me ask you this, those white panels, uh, there was like engineered, staged, uh, or there was a post-production with the, with the lighting when he was there? No, dancing. no, they were set up. They were set up. Oh, okay. yeah. Nice. You can't do that post-production. Back in the days, of course, no. Right. About Billie Jean, 
Do you think Michael Jackson realized at that moment of the filming of the music video that this is going to be the biggest hit of his career? Was it the biggest hit? I don't know. I don't know if he realized it was going to be the biggest hit, but he, he certainly had, he had Steve Barrow as the director, so he had a first-class director and had a great crew, uh, wonderful uh, set painter, incredible people, and so the entire crew was top-notch. So that was, I think that may have been one of the first big videos to come out then for MTV, and then it just all started, the videos started flowing out. After that, Michael Jackson inviting you to the Victory Tour. And um, as the photographer who'd been invited by the name as Michael Jackson at that time, yeah. I mean, you've been impressed, right? Mm. How did your family react on that? I just came off Elton John's tour. Oh, so you didn't Elton have Elton was the biggest in the world. world. Okay. But uh, I remember the story you were telling me about you've been dating with the girl on oh, that time. the girl time. who called me? Yes, when Michael Jackson called you. No, uh, so Michael Jackson called, and so they called my number. She took my voicemail. I'm, excuse me, what, was it? what do you call them back in the days? You're, uh, there, was, there was no voicemail. Uh, and so she, when she called me, she said, good news, bad news. Good news is, Michael Jackson wants you to go on his tour with him. He wants you to fly back now from Paris. Okay, what's the bad news? Uh, we're breaking up. <laughs> and I said, oh, why was that? She goes, no, you on tour for eight weeks, on the road, away from me, mm, that's not really not going to work. And she was right. You haven't seen her after that? No. No point. That's crazy. Like, your boyfriend is about to, f to shoot Michael Jackson tour. Stay with him. Yeah. What do you think about that, no? Wait, wait a minute. It wasn't... It wasn't like we were thinking about getting married. It was I, just like somebody you were hanging with. It wasn't, okay, so it wasn't like a serious relationship. Well, moment, there were moments it was serious, but okay. other than that, no, not really. It wasn't, we had only been going out for like a month or so, so it was no big deal. <laughs> so, Vice choice, you're going on Victory Tour with Michael Jackson. And um, as the photographer, and I feel like a lot of creators watching this interview right now, how do you make a deal of going um, on a tour with Michael Jackson, how are you making a deal on your price without like uh, not losing the opportunity and at the same time you don't want to hurt your feelings? Like what was your motivation with this offer? Um, there was no motivation. They told me what I was getting paid. Okay. There was no negotiating. No negotiating. And I went, eh. Actually, what they offered me was the same thing Elton John paid me 10 years before. How much it was? $300 a day. Not Seven bad. days a week. Not nah. bad. It was what, 1984? 84. I got the same thing in 74. Okay. So it wasn't like I was thrilled. It was like, hey, great, great opportunity, yada, 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 and a steady income, and so I, I did it. And then the next tour was more money, and the next tour was more money. What was the difference? Uh, year difference from one tour, second tour, and the less dangerous tour? 84 to 88. So Four the years. rate went from 300 a day and no per diem, <sighs> ridiculous, to uh, 750 a day plus $200 a day box rental for the equipment and $75 a day per diem. Dangerous tour was $1,000 a day, seven days a week, 250 plus 150 per diem, something. 9,000 around? Yeah. Right? Close to 9,000. So 9,000 a week. Which is not bad. Not, not for six months. I mean, for you, for you, the motivation wasn't money, obviously, right? Or that was a big part for Money's you? Money's always in. I mean, if he'd come low ball and came back, so we're going to pay you $300 a day, I'd have said no. I mean, so you want to say that if Michael Jackson would call you a second time or third time to go on a tour with him and he's going to give you the same pay as he did before, no. you wouldn't go with him? No, no point. Why? What's the deal? I mean, I was working, I had to work for Elton, I had to work for him. I was starting to work with Fleetwood Mac. So, there, I mean, I'd, done, I'd worked with Rod Stewart. What's, there's no reason. Have you been... 
have you been impressed by the way how Michael Jackson um, as an icon, as a music icon, was given the concerts, traveling around the United States during the first uh, tour, compared to the Elton John? I, I think Elton John was uh, more welcoming, more warming. You felt like you were part of the group. Uh, Elton would have special dinners for the band and for me and for you know, his crew and everybody. That'd be something really special. When my tour with Elton was over, I got uh, a day's pay, cash, and a Tiffany watch. Wow, which was around like five, six hundred? Yeah. That's in 1974. Not bad. Not bad, since you were getting paid every day and you, I didn't deserve, I didn't expect any bonus whatsoever. That was just thank you, not like a birthday just thank person, you. nothing like that. Just thank you. You still have that watch? I do. It actually was, it's quite funny because it was a, it's a Pulsar, it was made by Pulsar, so with the Tiffany engraved on the front. So it was quite expensive. And then a year later, the Pulsar came out with the watch and it was like $69. But you still didn't matter if you had Elton, it was given to you by Elton. When Michael wrapped up and gave us watches, there were Seiko watches that he got for free, so kind of a little difference. I don't, think, <laughs> I don't think Michael understood people or what it meant. I think he was so insulated that he didn't quite, quite get it. But that was okay. You mentioned that with the Elton John, you, f you feel yourself like you're part of the team, part of the group, part of the family. How isolated life was, Michael Jackson, was of Michael Jackson during the tour? 84 tour, we traveled, and so after we did the first couple of dates, we started sitting together on the airplane, talking about shots. Uh, he would sit on one side, you know, we were traveling together. It was a private plane on that one, so we were, we were traveling, we would sit and talk about doing the next shots, going here, going there. Uh, during the victory tour, we got to Detroit, and we set up a shot with the police of Detroit. It was a shot, long lens shot, Michael coming down the stairs with his glasses on, and all the policemen had the same gla Ray-Ban glasses, and they were coming down the stairs, and we shot it vertically. Oh, perfect Instagram, your buddies. Uh, <laughs> By the way, Sam doesn't like vertical photos. That's why these jokes are for you guys. <laughs> you love everything like vertically on your Instagram. No, so. no, I like vertical shots. I just don't like vertical shots of horizontal items. <laughs> this was shot as a vertical, and it was stacked together. And so it, he loved it. He thought it was great. And so we, uh, we did it, gave him the shot. I sent one to my agent. And then a couple of years later, I said, that was in 84? And so it had to be in actually around 90. I had a French girlfriend, lovely girl. Uh, and she was, there was a Zoom magazine, which was, a, which, which was the top French photography magazine at the time. And so she's thumbing through it. And she said, do you know what this is? And I said, yeah, it's Zoom Magazine. She goes, no, no, this is Photos of the Decade. Photo of the Decade issue of Zoom Magazine. I said, okay. And she said, oh, no, no, yours is one of them. Wow. Yours is one of 10 pictures in this magazine. It's a shot of Michael Jackson in Detroit coming down the steps. So for the year 1984, you're the one. Wow. So that was pretty cool. Quite impressive for the first tour to do a picture that's gonna be one of tens from the decade in French magazine. Yeah. Who came out with this idea of Michael Jackson appearing with this whole military crew? There was like kind of an obligation that he had to take before every concert or? No, it was no obligation. It's whenever we could put together a, a massive police uh, group, we did it. We did Entourage. it in Thailand, we did it. And my gosh, I can't tell you how many cities. Israel, uh, China, no, I didn't do China because that was a little scary. Uh, certainly did them everywhere we could. I know we did it one in, a big one in, uh, not Czechoslovakia, who was, I'm trying to think of where we went to that we had a big show. But all through Europe, wherever we could get the police together, you know, before the show or on a day off, 
uh, we would do it. Let's go back in tour days. Back in the days, I want to replicate the chronology of the way how you guys were arriving to the new city every day pretty much or every second day mm. and how was your day before the concert like what was scheduled for you before the concert of Michael Jackson well it changed over the decade I mean in the 84 tour Michael would rehearse in his room there was a deal in his contract that there had to be a 10 by 10 dance floor foot 10 by 10 dance floor wow. in the suite so I went up one day to the suite, he called me up, and there was just sweat. There was water all over the dance floor where he'd been working himself into a frenzy. I mean, dancing and dancing and dancing, he had cameras set up, dancing and dancing. It was incredible. Then once he asked me to come up, he and Frank were up there and they said, we have to talk to you. Frank called me. His manager. His manager. They had to talk to you. I said, oh, should I bring my camera? He goes, no just show up. So I come in and Frank and Michael are sitting across the room. So I take three steps in and I see something out of the corner of my eye at my feet. And it was that boa constrictor. And I jumped back and said some word we probably can't do on your interview. I said, what the is this? Because that scared the shit out of me. It scared the out of me. And so they were laughing. They thought it was hysterical. So there was a bet. So Michael, Frank said, no, Michael said, Sam's too cool to be bothered by that snake. Frank said, I'll bet you $50. <laughs> so Frank held his hand out, I'll take the 50. I said, what are you guys talking about? He goes, we <laughs> bet. Michael said you wouldn't be bothered. I said you'd be, you would, you would be. So that was funny. So Michael Jackson had that little stage, 10 per 10 in every hotel. As soon as he were arriving, he, did he step out from the hotel or he was in the hotel before the show and then obviously... He, he stayed in, he stayed in the hotel the whole time, except when I would pry him out. How that was? I mean, he, we, unless it was a police walk or something like that. Uh, there were times, where, where were we? Oh, should we get into, the, uh, get into Japan or talk about the shoot in Japan? We can do, yeah. <laughs> Photographer. Well, Sam, what kind of a challenge is this for you to be here tonight? I mean, is this unusual? What, what kind of question is this? Is this kind it. of a challenge to us tonight? This is great. Michael's all excited about the tour, especially coming back to Japan because he hasn't been to Japan in so long. I'm looking forward to it because Japan's one of my favorite countries to come and work in. So it's uh, just looking forward to it. The only challenge is watching out for the rain, I think. And that's the only thing I'm kind of worried about right now. Now, you've been here a few days now with Michael. Yeah. Any kind of funny experiences that you guys have been through that you can report to us? Besides waking up every morning at 2 o'clock because we still think we're back in Los Angeles, those kind of things. Nothing real, nothing really funny has happened yet. We've gone to a couple of places. He's gone to an amusement park. Uh, he went to a toy store the other day. Uh, we went to Sony. Basically, it's just all kind of work so far. But we're going to do a lot of fun things sooner or later. Once we get into it, once the show gets started and we get some little time, it'll be a lot of fun. Is Michael really looking forward to the American shows? Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot for that question. I think we were really excited about getting through these first. As a matter of fact, he's going to do a really different show for America this year. We're going to go back and rehearse all through the month of January, so the show will be completely different from 1984. All the new songs, all new costumes, all new set. Everything is going to be terrific. Now, you have traveled with Michael all over the world. And very well, few I know. People... I've played all over the United States well, very and few... Japan now. Very few people know Michael like you do. How would you describe Michael Jackson, the person that you know? Wait a minute, this is my job on the line here. How do I describe Michael Jackson, the guy I know? Um, very artistic, uh, very sensitive. I think everybody realizes that he's a very sensitive guy. Um, I don't think I want to describe uh, that kind of, you know, let's let it pass on that one. Okay. You know, that's a personal, you know, I can't answer personal questions like that. <laughs> All right. This particular time, we were... He met, there was a big press conference in Tokyo when we arrived. And so somebody, there's an older lady who had all these kimonos and said, we would like to get Michael dressed up, you know, do a photo shoot with Michael in his in the tr traditional Japanese samurai costume. Great. So we talked to Sony. We got uh, 
got the studio rented out, got a studio, got two assistants, got it all set up. So the problem with the shoot was, was that we had a Japanese security group who wouldn't stay off the walkie talkies. So the moment we were going out, they would open up the walkie and the paparazzi sitting outside on their motorcycles with the scanners knew what we were going, where we were going. So we come out, convoy, you know, big black, Merce big black Mercedes, Yukons, whatever, followed by this swarm of paparazzi. Get to the studio, they hold us back, hold them back, we run upstairs, because it's on the second floor. So they stopped. Then, as school let out, school children were walking down the walkway. We were in Rapungi, biggest, busiest thoroughfare, right off the busiest thoroughfare. So they asked the paparazzi, who were sitting there with their cameras and stuff, why are you here? Evidently they asked him. They said, oh, Michael Jackson's here. So then the children didn't <coughs> go home. They stopped, waiting to see Michael Jackson. And then more children got out. And then more children. So we looked out the window. A policeman came up and said, we're having a little crowd issue here with children and bystanders. So we're going to have to call it quits here. I looked at Michael and we went, yeah, right. Okay. So, we, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir. <coughs> Laugh. He left. Looked at a little later, and they had to put up barricades. This is now rush hour in Rapongi in Japan. So it's not like three people live there. Tens of thousands. Wow. So now they have barricades creeping out into the street, blocking off one lane. Policeman comes up, talks to my assistant, goes, you gotta, it's gotta stop. I said, tell him, that's fine, we'll be done shortly. And I look at Michael and go, no, we're not done with shortly. <laughs> so about 30, 45 minutes later, we were wrapping, we were getting pretty, pretty much shot, all the shots we needed, but a photographer is never gonna say he's done. And Michael is never going to say he's done. Banging on the door. Guy comes in. Older guy. Braids, braids, awards, buttons, everything. Gold on the hat. And starts screaming at us. And I looked at the assistant and said, we're done, right? And he goes, yes, sir, you're done. And you <laughs> need to leave now. So, uh, Michael changed back into his clothes, and because at that point, that whole side of the traffic was impassable, was blocked by people. So, that lane of Rapungi was shut down. Wow. So, we shut it down, and so, we left. But, we did a lot of shoots in Japan. One of my favorites was when I had been there with Fleetwood Mac in Tokyo. I had seen school children wearing yellow caps, white shirts, black jumpers with straps. I went, that's great. So I said, Mike, when we go back, call Sony, find out where that school is, or a school that wears that same outfit. And what we'll do is, I'll get up above you, we'll surround you with these yellow caps, the Japanese children, and you'll wear a red shirt, and you'll do your thing. And he goes, Mm, okay. So we get there. It's kind of rain. It, ugh, we picked the one day it rains in Japan. It was drizzling, so we kind of held off for a little while. I got up on the second story with a Hasselblad. Uh, we put Michael up there, and he was laughing because all these kids were staring at him. And so we had to, had to tell the children to look at me, not look at Michael, because he, he couldn't keep a straight face. He was laughing. And so we shot it. Um, shot about four or five rolls. And it became uh, a Life magazine, which is, was important at the time before Instagram. It became a very, it was an important shot for me. It may have been my first shot in, in life. Wow. Speaking about doing the pictures with Michael, those spontaneous shoots that you guys did. As a photographer, I'm curious, what was your personal technique of convincing Michael Jackson to do certain pictures that you had in your mind? Just tell what's, him. What's the way of like communication you guys had? Oh, we were sitting together, usually on the plane, or I was sitting in his room, and I would just say, "This is, this was actually before we even got to Japan, we had discussed that shot." And so that worked. We didn't discuss the kimono shot. I mean, the samurai shot, 
until we were there. Then I had gone to Osaka Castle, Osaka Castle when, we were, when we were in Osaka, and I went, oh, well, let's do a shot at Osaka, Osaka Castle, because there's this huge mound of rock, I mean, like a mountain, not a mountain, but a, but a hill, it's a rocky hill. I can put you on the top, and I can fill, flash fill it, and then we can see the Osaka Castle rising up behind you. Well, I don't know, that doesn't sound like something I want to do. Oh, come on, it'll be great, don't worry, it's gonna look great, it'll be unusual. Okay, so uh, we get in our caravan again with every paparazzi in Japan following me behind us, but we managed to lose him, managed to actually block the road and get to Osaka Castle and Michael and I got up on the hill. Well, evidently, the security at Osaka Castle were looking down and saw us. This big group of people coming up to the back and stopping. They didn't know, we hadn't spoken to them about it. So they came charging down the hill. These three or four security guys came charging down the hill. We had our Japanese interpreter say, we're not doing anything. We're not going to go inside. We just want to shoot out here. Well, evidently they called it back up. And we happened to be there during elementary school day drawing class. And so suddenly, like lemmings over a hill, school children were pouring down. Wow. Michael looked at it and went, oh my God. I said, don't worry. Then we were on the rock, fortunately, so they weren't allowed up on the rock. But completely surrounding us were Japanese children. And Michael went, oh, great idea, Sam, really great idea. <laughs> I said, what are they going to do, bite your knees? I mean, come on, they're just little children. They're not going to hurt you. And they're just in awe. It's great. So we actually made a better shot with the children behind. They were like, again, with caps on, and I had Michael wear a green jacket, a green shirt. So it was perfect contrast, and we got the shot. And afterwards, he goes, yeah, these are great. At the time, he wasn't so sure. Have you ever felt like the situation with the huge group of people around Michael Jackson can go out of the control during the photos that you guys have been doing? For our photo shoots, no, but when we were going through t cities, uh, sometimes it got kind of, or coming into arenas, it got pretty, pretty bad. I mean, also, you have paparazzi, especially in Italy, who are on motorcycles, who are trying to cut off the vans, getting in front of the vans. We kind of think we nicked a couple, but they would get around the van and try to get in front so, and stop so that they could shoot pictures through the window. Of course, you couldn't see anything through the window because Michael was in the back anyway. But that got better danger, very dangerous. It really was scary. Let's go back to the bad, Michael Jackson bad music video shoot directed by Martin Scorsese mm -hmm. that was filmed in New, New York. York, New York subway. Subways. And um, I want to talk especially about this beautiful, iconic shot that probably every person on this planet saw Michael Jackson bad which is done by Sam Emerson. So they say. So they say. This amazing, beautiful, uh, iconic image. Can you tell a story about how actually you guys did this photo? Because I know that there is a, a little story behind. So we go to New York, something I didn't tell you. So we go to New York and we're all California guys, right? We're all there flying from California to New York. So the first couple of days are shot at a school where Michael is supposed to be attending in the video. He's attending the school and he comes down the way. Nobody told us there was snow on the ground. You guys filmed in winter, right? Oh yeah. We were not dressed for winter. We were California and we were not dressed. So basically Michael was wrapped up in blankets, ferny pads from the camera truck between shots. We were freezing and so eventually Everybody asked what size shoes we wore, what size jackets we wore, and my, the security guys went out and bought us coats and jackets and stuff. It was cold. So we went from that, we segued from there into the subway, which is warmer, obviously. And so we're shooting, I don't know, three, four days, whatever. There's one cute shot I get, which I don't have with us, where Michael is trying to tell Martin Scorsese First, Martin tells him, this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to shoot it. I said, so you see Michael thinking, he goes, Michael's going, I want to do, you know, I think we should shoot it this way. And then he 
the next sequence in the shot is Mark Scorsese saying, telling Michael, that's not the way we're going to shoot it. We're going to shoot it this way. And you see Michael with his hand and his head down. You can't really argue with Martin Scorsese, so we shot it Martin's way. And after the shoot, we'd shot for days and days. I had a, had a background set up probably for four days, all lit, assistants sitting there waiting. Just for this shot? Yeah. Well, no, not for this shot. We didn't know what shot that was going to be. But how, look, how the background was looking? What? How the background that, that you set it up? It was white. Okay. Because he's wearing a black outfit. You don't want to wear something. So it was set up to shoot after every day, and Michael was, I'm too tired, don't want to do it. I'm too tired, don't want to do it. Oh, I don't want to do it. Okay. Last day, Michael finishes. We wrap. I said, Mike, we need to get this being set up. And Mike said, I, I, don't, I don't feel like it. I don't want to do it. And so his manager, Frank DeLeo, said, Michael, the assistant's been sitting there for four days. We're paying for this. Give Sam four or five rolls. Okay. So, boom. We shot four, maybe five rolls fast. Just kept hanging me the backgrounds. Hand me the roll, hand me the roll, hand me, hand me the back. Shut it. And then it came out, and it looked pretty good. So, what we did was, they were going to use another shot of Michael with his face covered with lace, which was a steal from another photographer. I'm trying to, can't remember the name of him. Uh, but it was probably of Marlena Dietrich or something. Mm -hmm. And so, Walter Yetnikoff saw these pictures and said, no, 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 that lacy thing, no, it's not gonna happen. We're going to use this because this mic makes Michael look tough, makes him look good, strong. So there we are. So Marlena is still mad on you. Marlena wasn't around to be mad at me. Her ghost was still mad at me. <laughs> Greg Gorman was still mad at me. Do you consider that this photo is the most iconic photo of the Michael Jackson? Yeah. Are you happy with that? Sure. Nothing. Uh, it's great. It's probably one. It's probably the most published picture I ever took. I'm thinking, yes. As I mean, you see, calendars, tour books, for years and years and years, there's people are still using that picture. And on every album, in the back of the album, there is a credit, Sam Emerson, on this photo. As it should be. That's the way it is. Are you getting paid for every publishing of this photo on no. the CD? No, no, that's, that's Sony's copyright. So pretty much you sold the photo as you did it? No big deal. I mean, it, would, it didn't, didn't hurt me. They paid me $5,000 to use it. For this photo? Yeah. So it's fine by me. It was good money on that time. Yeah. And you didn't know like, how big this photo going to be, obviously. When you looked at it, you knew. You knew when you looked at special. it, you knew Michael was going to like it. So there we are. It's one of his favorite ever. <sighs> the question that I have right now, nowadays, you're going to admit, the life in Instagram and social media, the way how people portray their, their life, is fake. People are, people are showing only a, a good moments, you know what I mean? And they trying to make, make believe their followers that this moment is, is real, right? I'm on a boat, I'm on here, I'm on there. My question is to you, how real was this moment? How real was these pictures? Well, my room was above Michael's and I could look out and I could see the crowd. That's in Argentina, Buenos Aires. So it's massive, filling the whole courtyard outside the hotel. So I said, so Mike kind of came out on the patio. I said, Mike, he was in an, actually, that's a black and white shirt. Too bad it's not in color because I have, he was in an orange shirt. Looks great. So in the green background and the green of flowers, trees. So I said, uh, let's get a picture of you. Stand up. Mm, turn around, look at me. I'll get the crowd in the background. Okay. Mm, that doesn't work so good. You got to stand on something. You got to get higher. So we found a box, he found a box or something, he found a box, so and he, that's him actually over the ledge, and it's a long, you know, you know, as you can see, it's probably five, six stories. 
So he was a little uncomfortable, but it's a great shot. I mean, he's smiling and happy and click, click, click. That's enough. And then he gets down. Did Michael really enjoy and do the pictures with the crowd and with the people around Oh, he him? loved it. We had, uh, even in 84, we did slideshows in his room probably twice a week because we had Sony Epic set up. Uh, who, what record company was that? You know, I don't even remember because it changed the names. It was Epic, Epic Records. Epic Records. So, uh, but yeah, but in Europe it was, by then it was Sony in, in Asia. So we would call ahead different labs and, and everybody had, they had an office in certain cities. So we would save the film until we got to certain cities and then we would take it to a secure lab and, and have them deal with it, process it. Let's talk about Run Run Shaw. Before Run Run Shaw, oh. I have a good question for you. I see a lot of this. Actually, guys, like this is everything on this table is a history. This is, this is amazing. Like how many beautiful moments you witnessed and you captured. And because of you, we have an idea like how it was on the film. I see a lot of like nice, great, like fun photos. Like this is Michael with uh, Macaulay Culkin and with the director of the black and white music video, right? John Landis, yeah. Yes. You have a lot of, you have a lot of like great positive photos. Have you ever had chance to take pictures of some sad moments of Michael Jackson's life? Mm. During that period, there wasn't much sadness, really. Uh, nor was any photos when he wasn't when he wasn't uh, up to it. I mean, if he wasn't up to it, we just didn't do it. I mean, he was the boss. If you couldn't coerce him into doing something, we just didn't do it. But no, I don't think we have anything. There's one shot, which I think we, I brought, but we, I don't see it. It's of him being contemplative uh, during Dirty Diana, where he's just kind of walking around backstage with his hands and just kind of thinking. And it's one of my favorite pictures of him because it's completely out of, it's completely different from everything else. It's him caught unawares. I think we know that Michael Jackson was a perfectionist in his field. Have he been very like precisive in the photos that you have been taken of him? Is, and is there any like certain angles or certain things that you have to have in your mind during the pictures of Michael? No, oh, the lighting was all the same. The lighting had to be the same. We're working on a video, part of the Chicago Night Smooth Criminal, that whole expanse of videos, Speed Demon. And so we're getting set up, and I go out to the set and look at it, and then I go over to the producer, who I knew, because he'd been, I said, you know, that lighting's not gonna work. So he called the DP over, DP, and I said, you know, Michael likes to be lit a certain way. This, this isn't what he likes. And he said, nobody tells me how to light a set. Wow. And I said, okay, excuse me. So I go back and talk to Michael. So Michael says, are you, are, am I going to be happy with the lighting? Or are you happy with the lighting? And I said, well, it's not what we usually do. And he said, what do you mean? I said, because it's kind of harder than we like. We like certain softness and fill likes here, and, and none of that's there. He said, did you tell him that? And I said, yeah, I told him. And what did they say? The DP said, nobody tells me how to light my set. He said, okay, we'll do it his way. You go tell him, we'll do it your way. And if I don't like every shot, we're not gonna use it and you're not getting paid. Hmm. So I went to the producer and I said, let me talk to you for a second. Michael said, no problem. We'll do it this way, your way. But if he doesn't like any of it, the video is canceled and you're not getting paid. I said, <coughs> okay, well, uh, DP. <laughs> Sam, tell him how we want this lit. And he didn't speak to me the rest of the shoot. I mean, it was several days, I'm sure, that he never spoke to me again. But that was that. It was like the Pepsi commercials. Do we have any pictures from Pepsi? Yeah, we do. 
Ah, the Pepsi commercial. Ah. That's the first Pepsi commercial that Michael and I worked together on. So we have a director, great commercial director, Joe Pitka. So Joe is rather bombastic, how would I say, emotional. And Michael heard about that, and so everybody knew, I mean, how he was. So in the contract it was, you will not raise your voice, you will not curse as long as Michael Jackson is on the set. So that was the deal. So we're shooting a little bit, and so Karen Faye is his makeup person, hair person, so she goes, she goes, uh, Joe, I need to look through the camera. Joe's face went blue cold. <laughs> what? I need to look through the camera. Okay. So she looked through the camera, and I could see Joe's jaw, I think his teeth were chipping. He was gripping his jaw so tight, because nobody did that to Joe's camera. So she said, oh, no, that's great. Okay, good. So he ended up doing at least two Pepsi commercials and two videos with him. And that, that was the deal, no raising your voice. The moment everybody, the moment Michael left the set, then it changed. I see a lot of uh, beautiful behind the scenes photos that you did from several Michael Jackson music videos. Well, it's like not really behind the scenes if he's on the set. Smooth Criminal, Billie Jean, Black and White. What is your favorite music video shoot that you attended? and you would, you've been working on? Probably the In the Closet. In the Closet. It was Naomi was Campbell. Naomi Campbell, Herb Ritz directed it. Uh, it was beautifully lit, it was outside. There's Herb's picture with Herb right there. And it was just a great location. Where actually you guys filmed this? Somewhere in Utah? Indian Indian Springs, Indian Desert, out in the, near Palm Springs. So that little story about that little deal was, so that's Red Skelton uh, with Herb Ritz and Michael. And Red Skelton is a famous comedian from back in the 50s. Uh, he was extremely famous and it was a great, uh, and Michael wanted to meet him. Same thing like Jackie Gleason, we met Jackie in Miami, had dinner with Jackie Gleason. So anyway, so we're there. And so this is the location, we're going out to Palm Springs. Palm Desert, Indian Springs, whatever they call that place. It's just a effing desert. So we get to our hotel and we know where Herb's staying with his group. Hair, makeup, camera guys are all staying in this resort. Great. So we figured, yeah, good for us. So me, the wardrobe guys, Michael's hair, makeup, all our group, pull up to our hotel. We get out and we go, are you sure this is the right place? Because it was like, uh, I don't want to mention any brand names, <laughs> but to be honest, it was a little scary. It was not up to where we normally stay. <laughs> so we all went in our rooms and with our luggage and we all came out of our rooms with our luggage and we got together and we sent a message to Herb, his production manager, that we were going back to Los Angeles, that we weren't going to stay there. And if he didn't find us a place now, we're leaving, which meant no video. So shortly afterwards, we're in a new resort. Wow. I know. Surprise. So that was that. I think, and then the video started, and it was once we got our room cell sorted out. Uh, the shoot was fantastic and it was great. Herb was doing a great job. I was shooting stills, which Herb normally did. And Naomi was on the set and she was fabulous and the dancing was great. Michael was a little intimidated by her. She's a little wilder than he was. It used was to. their first time working together, right? First time. First time meeting her, probably. So that was, it was fun. But it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a great shoot. Really? Michael, Michael looks very confident in that music video. Like that's pretty, I, I wouldn't say it's not like super provocative music video, but they look together like really nice well, as a couple. Well, there's some shots that are pretty provocative. I mean, where their, their arms are intertwined, if you, I think, which one was it? 
Yeah, that was great. There's a, there, there are more, which I didn't bring, which are a little more. What did I want to say? Closer, but those were, those were great shots. And I some, get some great shots of Naomi by herself in the door. She was, well, obviously she's a, she's a great model. So the shots of her by herself were fantastic, really fantastic. Did Michael feel comfortable with Naomi Campbell? Mm, yeah, I think he felt comfortable with her. We're not going to tell that story, are we? <laughs> Probably no. not. No, there's a, there's a story which you can't tell. But yeah, I think he felt comfortable once, uh, it was, once the guidelines were established. You mentioned about this hotel where you guys were staying. Either it was a music video shoots or the tours. My question is this, like how secure was the situation of Michael Jackson being the hotel? Do you guys rented the whole floor, whole hotel? Michael, had, we, Michael would rent a whole floor for himself and then we would stay with security would be on the floor. Uh, the, that floor would be locked off so that only we could use it. Uh, I usually stayed there with Michael, head of security, all the security guys stayed there, manager, whatever. Uh, I got moved off. What was the reason? Well, after one show, Michael said, my understanding is that you have a revolving door on your room or something <laughs> where a lot of females seem to be coming all the time and that's on my floor and so it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. So do you mind if I move you down one flight? I went, and that's even better for me. <laughs> I have to deal with security all the time. So yeah, sure, that was it. Michael was very cool about those personal situations that you guys had during the tour. Yep. He didn't care. Actually, like, like he asked me, to, what did you do last night? Where'd you go? Who'd you come back with? What'd you do? Uh, well, so that, it was fun. He was, he was interested in what some hedonistic guy was doing. Michael never was into the hanging out after the concert, like meeting no, with the fans or stuff like this. He was more business. He was business is business. I'm here to do a show. I'm here to rest. I did my show. I'm going to rest. And then, I mean, sometimes on the off days, we would do slideshows and so on and so forth. Or we'd go out for a photo shoot. But it was never any of this, uh, let's go sightseeing. Because usually, in, like in Rome, we shot these amazing pictures in Rome. But it was always, we were isolated. But the shots were breathtaking. It was red shirt, top of a building, overlooking Rome. It was fantastic. But no, there weren't, there was, I mean, we would have it to ourselves. Same with Disney, Disneyland in Tokyo. There was only 50 people there. We had it to ourselves. Uh, Disney World in Florida, which I went to way too many times. Uh, we would have security, we'd go underneath, there's tunnels underneath all through that place. So we'd go underneath uh, to the ride, go to the front of the ride, we'd do the ride and come back. Next time we had a day off, we'd go back to the Disney World and do the same ride again. So we did basically the same thing every time. Uh, let's go back to the Dangerous Tour. You guys travel in, in Europe, in Asia, Japan, and Hong Kong. Well. We were in Japan, we finished Japan. We did those great photo shoots. And so we did a bunch of photo shoots in Japan. So Michael said, so we have like a week, two weeks off between now and Australia. But I, I send the band back, but I don't want to go. Well, where do you want to go, Sam? So I said, Barrier Reef? Great Barrier Reef would be great. He goes, you mean the sun and the sand? Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. So I said, let me think tomorrow. So I said, have you ever been to Hong Kong? No. Let's go to Hong Kong. Oh. I said, it's going to be great. Chinese on the water, be cool, be fun. You've never been there. They won't bother you. Let's do it. So I said, okay. So at the time, I wasn't feeling well. Like I had a little cough. So security said to me, we would like you to stay behind and fly on the next flight out. You and Karen have both been coughing a little bit, so we don't want Michael to get sick. So you can fly out. So, okay. So, but what about all this luggage and camera equipment and all this stuff? Don't worry, we'll take care of it. Tell Japan Airlines, 
you know, you're with Michael Jackson, it'll always be cleared, I'll clear it with, well, so we go to the airport, I've got all this massive cart full of stuff. And so they said, well, we have to charge you for excess luggage. I said, oh, uh, it's already been cleared, check with Japan Airlines, you know, your, your boss, uh, went with Michael Jackson, they go, and? And it's been cleared we're gonna fly with all this stuff? No. <laughs> Wait, you mean it hasn't been cleared? No. So my bill for my luggage was $1,200. Wow. That's in 1988. That's a lot. So 1200 bucks. So I said, whatever. So we get to Tokyo and we go back to head of security goes, I thought you were going to get this cleared. Oh yeah, I forgot. It's $1,200. I'll take it now. So they paid us back. I mean, obviously. But while we were in Hong Kong, he'd never been there. So we, we were staying in a great hotel and we were going to stay for three days. Mike said, we can only stay for three days because we have to go to New Zealand and do press conference in Australia and do, you know, press, press meters. And so I said, okay, that's great. Three days is fine. We'll do. So we were invited by, you have a picture of Sir Run Run Shaw somewhere? Okay, Run Run Shaw. Sir, Sir Run Run Shaw. Sir Run Run Shaw. We were invited to Sir Run Run Shaw's studio. Sir Run Run Shaw is, he basically controlled all the Chinese television. He had the only studio in Hong Kong. So all the Chinese operas, everything that was done, was done through his studio. Uh, he also was instrumental in finding Bruce Lee and getting Bruce Lee to what he became. So we were invited to dinner uh, at Sir Ronan Shaw. Great, very impressive. Well, first we pull into the studio and I've never seen so many Rolls Royces in my life. There had to be maybe 30 Rolls Royces lined up. It wow. seemed he would buy one, a new Rolls Royce every year and keep the old ones. It was like I said, oh, Mike, this is talking big money here. That's a lot of shit. So we go to dinner and finish dinner and talk to Michael. And so I was talking to Michael and he's being interpreted. And so Michael said, you seem so vibrant for your age. He goes, I eat a lot of snake. You eat snake? Yeah, I eat snake. Makes my private part hard. Is that a good word? I didn't use, a, I didn't use anything bad. Makes my private parts hard. And so Michael, of course, turns the same color as his red shirt. <laughs> and so that was that. And then his, his assistant came over and said, Ron Ron Shaw's assistant said, we would like you to use, do a photo shoot on our studio. And I said, I don't know if we can afford that. I mean, it's a pretty big deal to a photo shoot. And they go, oh, no, no, no. We pay for everything. Costumes, actors, extras, sets. We will set dress. You go through tomorrow, come back, walk through and pick sets. We will decorate it, have everything set for you. Wow. So we came back. And it was an incredible shoot. It was so much fun. And so we, instead of the three days we were supposed to stay there, Michael said, no, it's Japan. Sorry, I haven't been there. I didn't know. Show it again, show it again. I haven't been there. I don't even know. Okay. Sorry. OK. No, that's still Japan. I we, know. That's not, that's not there. That's where it was, right here. skip over. Right here. So that was the shoot. So I mean, as you can see, he supplied actors in makeup and wardrobe with the huge dresses, headdresses, everything. It was fantastic. And so we were supposed to be there three days. I think we stayed there two weeks and we blew off Australia press conference and New Zealand press conference because Michael was having so much fun. Did Michael have an, had an idea about who these people are who were invited him? Did he know who is the say? Sir? Shah? Yeah. You have to, he had to look him up because he wasn't aware of who he was. But once he found out what he did, and once you saw the studios, there was no question we, were, we weren't going to shoot there. And didn't, nothing was going to stop that. It was fantastic. And then there's another shot of him where we're in Hong Kong with the, on the boat. Right, this one. That's it. That's Hong Kong Harbor. We went through Hong Kong Harbor. And we also went to Macau, because Macau was still under... At that time, Hong Kong and Macau were under British rule. So we're on the 
hydroplane boat. And I took Michael up to the, to the front to where the captain was. They were steering the boat. Took some pictures with him. Then Michael said, can I, I said, can we get a picture of Michael steering the boat? And he goes, uh, you mean Michael Jackson steering the, the, the ferry to Macau? And I said, yeah. He goes, uh, that's kind of really irregular. And he said, but okay. So we got Michael steering, Michael was steering the boat to Macau wow. from Hong Kong. Not for a long period of time, needless to say, but he did it. I see this beautiful personal credit of Sam Emerson getting on what? The Dangerous World Tour. That's actually what you carried with you all the time, right? When you were The going. Dangerous Tour. Yeah. Needless to say, I took the picture because I had to have it, it lit perfectly, just like Michael. That's beautiful. Oh my God. So then we went to, during, the, you should pull up the Italian pictures. That's a good story. There's one. Where's it's Stallone? Rome, right? where's, yeah, but where's Stallone? By Mr. Stallone. So we're doing a show in Rome, and Sylvester Stallone shows up, comes backstage, obviously, and I had a background set up. I took lights with me and background through every location. I had an assistant to set it up. So Sly comes in and goes, Hey, I thought you were supposed to be working on my movie here. <laughs> and I said, uh, yeah. He goes, so how come you're on the Michael Jackson tour and not taking my movie pictures? I said, because you were afraid to get out in the snow. You didn't wait until the snow cooled off. And so I got an offer to another job, and here we are. It's okay, but next time, you're doing my movie. Wow. So I ended up doing four movies with him. After the tour of Michael Jackson. Yeah, I'd done one before, but after that, we continued. And so the other shot of him in the Roman Gladiator outfit or the Centurion, excuse me, not Gladiator, but Centurion. Uh, we decided, because we're, in, we're here, we, we, his wardrobe guy said, he said, why don't we do a shot, why don't we get you dressed up like an old Roman Centurion? So we had had a party, someone had had a party for us, oh, the American ambassador had a party for us. And he said, we would like you to do that photo shoot. So that photograph is in the American ambassador's backyard. Okay. And his wife brought us tea sandwiches and lemonade. So we felt pretty cool. That was kind of fun. I see a lot of um, photos that you guys did that was so spontaneous and was by invitations of those people who you were visiting, either like Hong Kong, Rome. I know you personally have been introduced to Princess Diana and uh, King. Prince Charles, well, now King. Now King, yeah. Can you tell about this story? Michael one day said, and well, we were at Wembley, because we did like seven, eight shows at Wembley, uh, came to me and said, Sam, tomorrow night, Princess, Prince Charles and Princess Diana are going to be here, so be ready to take some pictures. Okay, great. So we're there. I'm dressed, as always. Michael always said, I never had to worry about how you're going to look. Always knew that you'd be good. You would never embarrass me. So. Okay, we're ready. So Prince Charles, Princess Diana, Michael says, I'd like you to introduce my still photographer, Sam Emerson. Prince Charles leans in, rubs my lapel and goes, very nice suit, Mr. Emerson. Are you available to work for me tomorrow night? Wow. Which is kind of a, wow, okay. Uh, you have to ask my boss. And Mike said, absolutely, before the show, no problem. What did you two talk about? I wrote a song called Dirty Diana. And it's not about Lady Diana, it's about certain kind of girls <clears throat> that hang around concerts or clubs. You know, they call them groupies. The groupies, mm -hmm. I've lived in that all my life. You see these girls, they do everything with the band and the, you know, everything you can imagine. So I wrote a song called Dirty Diana. But I took it out of the show in honor of Her Royal Highness. And she, she took me away and she said, <laughs> I said, no, I took it out of the show because of you. She said, no, I want you to do it. Do it. Do the song. So she had a sense of humor with you. Yeah, of course. So that night I worked for, uh, the next night I worked for Prince Charles, and he had a 
function upstairs at Wembley, and he had a fighter there, and he said, Sam, this is going to be the next heavyweight champion. This is Lennox Lewis. I went, in my mind, I'm going, yeah, right. This guy? And he was. Amazingly enough, he was. So it was a very special evening. That meeting um, with the Princess Diana and now King Charles, um, that was because Michael Jackson did a huge donation, $100,000 to the Children Foundation with the Pepsi, if I'm not mistaken. But he did that in most cities. Pepsi Cola donated money to children's organizations in almost every city we went to. We always had a check presentation. And this is what I wanted to ask you. Like every city, like because nowadays this is very rare that you can see that the artist who is traveling like around the world and giving the concerts in London, Paris, Munich, Munich and so on and so forth. Every city that he goes, he visits the children hospital. When we can. When he can. Uh, when it's available, we always went. We always went, and he, and it was really touching, because you know I'm on tour and I have children, and Michael said you seem to be really bothered by this sometime, and I said, well, I have children and I hate to see children in this condition, children who are terminal, children who have cancer, children who are in a hospital is like this. I said, Ugh, it's just touching. You know, it hurts a little bit. How kind Michael Jackson was. He loved going to see children and loving to make them happy. He was great, really good about that. But there was another story in London. Because I had fired in London, didn't the, I? Yes, and you have been also on the front page of Sun magazine. <laughs> Sam Am Jack O Sex Sex Pest. Ah, uh, millionaire photographer, Sam Emerson. And I'm going, wait a minute, millionaire photographer? Where's the <laughs> other $800,000? <laughs> I'm missing something somewhere. Anyway, so this story appeared, and it was all brought about because uh, Michael had seen some pictures in a magazine, which was, he didn't like. It was him in a pair of pajamas, on a video, and he hated the video, hated it, hated the pajamas. Hated it, was, it. it wasn't bad, like being in pajama, like. It, he's the boss. Okay. He didn't like the shots. <laughs> so I got called in by his manager and goes, "Hey, these shots just ran, and uh, we know you're the only photographer there. So, what's the deal? Michael is really furious. He hates these. Hates it. So I said, I didn't do it." And he goes, really? Because evidently you're the only photographer. How did he get the pictures? So I call a magazine. The magazine said Sony gave them to us. I called Sony. Sony said Bob Jones, his publicist, gave him the shots. Didn't run them by Michael, just gave him the shots directly. So I went back to, to the management, to, to Bill, I mean, I'm sorry, to Frank DeLeo, and said, Frank, I did the research. Not me. He said it was uh, Bob Jones. He said, well, Michael's really upset and uh, you can't fire Bob, but we can fire you. Mm. So I said, that's total BS. I, I mean, obviously I didn't do it, so you're firing me for no reason, basically. And he goes, yeah, but Michael, whatever. So I said, okay, I'll take it but you're going to pay me for another week and you're going to let me go to Tenerife and you're going to fly me there and then you'll fly me home. Okay, so Tenerife's a nice island off the coast of Spain. So I was contacted by the editor of the Sun-Times here. He said, I understand you've been fired. I said, yeah. Well, yes. And he goes, why? And I said, uh, that's, that's a business decision on Michael's part. I really don't discuss it. He goes, why don't we have dinner? and we'll talk about it. I want to hear your side of the story. So he invited me to a restaurant. Well, it wasn't a very good restaurant, actually, I don't remember it. Kind of, it was like a pub. Ich. So I'm there, and we're talking, having, ordering dinner. And my agent in New York calls me and goes, where are you? I said, I'm at dinner. Dinner with who? 
I'm dinner with the, uh, one of the editors at The Sun. And he goes, really? He said, yeah, he's asking me, you know, why I got fired. And he wants to know that my side of it. He goes, you're being skewered. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, they already have the story running. Wow. The story is running, and you're not going to be happy with it. So the story ran about me being, uh, me propositioning young fans outside of the hotel. It said, as young as 14 years old. And it showed a picture of me talking to two girls who were 14. The problem is, they were talking to my son, who was to my left. They cropped my son out of the picture and left me talking to two 14-year-old girls. I was furious. Called Michael's attorney, John Branca. I said, John, we've got to sue him. This is not me. I didn't do it. I didn't proposition these girls. And he goes, well, as long as they don't run it in the U.S., you, that's where your income is based. You don't get a, you have no recourse. Mm. So I was really, I was, I didn't sleep that night. I was, I was in tears. I was so upset that I, getting fired for no reason. And then I got, I was going to a club the next day in London because I still was getting taken to Turner Reef. And so the taxi driver had that paper in the front seat. And I said, oh, she's, said, Jacko. I said, and you didn't realize that's me, right? Wait. And the guy said, well, that's you. You were Sam Emerson. I said, yes. He goes, I said, I'm really upset about that. It's really just, he said, oh, don't be upset, mate. Me and the boys down at the pub think you were absolutely fantastic. You are, what, 34 years old, and you're going out with 14-year-old girls? Fantastic, mate. I went, oh, okay, so I'm not so bad after all. And they weren't really 14. I did go out with an 18-year-old. But anyway, that's another story. So then I didn't feel so bad. And I had to go to Tenerife and get a nice suntan and get a free flight first class ticket home. When this situation happened, have you had a chance to talk to the Michael like right away personally? Nope. Didn't want to know because he knew I really, he, once he found out I didn't really do it, he didn't want to deal with it. Which is actually a blessing in disguise because once I got fired, I went back to LA and started working on a movie, on films. I had already started, I'd done La Bamba, Driving Miss Daisy, and I was doing, you know, that's an Academy Award winning film. So I was getting paid really well to be back home. Then about six months later, got a call from Bill Bray, who's head of security. Uh, Michael wants you to, uh, uh, Sam, Michael wants you to come back in and work for him again. No. What? Wow. What? No. Uh, well, okay, we're not going to talk about you selling these pictures uh, of Michael to that magazine. I said, no, because you know I didn't do it, A, and B, Nobody gave me a chance to explain myself. So here's the deal. I'm going to hang up my phone. Don't you ever dial my number again. Did you say like that? Yep. Wow. Don't you ever dial me again. Uh, 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 click. Two nights later, or two days later, I get a call from Michael's personal assistant. Sam. Michael's not happy. He wants to work with you again. He's not happy with who he's been dealing with. He wants you back. Norma, mm, not going to happen. I said, you know, I didn't do it. I never got an apology, no recognition for the fact that I didn't do it. I'm working on films. I'm really not, I don't need this anymore. It was personal for you. Well, it hurt my feelings. I mean, the fact that he wouldn't even listen to the explanation that he knew it wasn't me, but he wouldn't fire the person who did it. And that was how many years you already knew each other? Like more than... That had to be the end of 88. So that we'd been touring for over f almost five years. Okay. So then I'm in bed and I'm working on a film with, a, with my friend Philip, who's a set, to, I mean, a prop guy. And so like right 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning, phone rings. Oh my God. Uh, answer the phone. Sam? This is Michael. I went, oh, Philip, come on, man. We have to get early call tomorrow. Don't, don't be messing with me. No, this is, real, this is really Michael. Okay. What? Well, I'm going to be starting this video pretty soon, and I, I'd like you to come back and 
work with me again. Okay, when? They said, yeah, gave me the dates. And I said, oh, I'll be finishing then. So, okay, I'll do it. So that was, that was black or white. So I'm on the set a couple days. I have a set up, background set up to shoot pictures. And I've shot all the extras and the dancers. Couldn't get Michael to come back. So I'm not feeling really good about it. I'm just uncomfortable. So I called Norma, his assistant, and said, Norma, get somebody else. This isn't working for me. I'm not happy. I'm not happy the way it's going. Uh, Michael's kind of, kind of cold. Not as not the way it used to be. Even after that phone call, you guys didn't have like that warm. No, hug. Not, like, not like the rapport we had. Yes. The creative rapport we had before. So. I said, I said, let him know. I get somebody else. I'll be gone in a week. Wow. So then, I got a call and said, Michael wants to see you in his trailer. Go to his trailer. And he goes, I know you're upset. I said, yeah, I'm upset. You never said you were sorry. You never acknowledged the fact that I didn't do what you said I did. And yet here we are trying to work together. He goes, well, I know, you know, you've been, your agent's been doing these photos around the world for, for all this time, I know, since we started working together. Uh, but I told you that was, those weren't mine, and I didn't do that, and you know who did. I know, I know. He said, here's who we can do. If you'll stay with me, you can, whatever you have and whatever you, in the future, whatever you do, you own it. Wow. Oh. You can own it. And then later, there were two exceptions to that rule. The exception was the Oprah Winfrey interview, which Oprah owned, which I had no right to, and the Family Honors, which we did in Las Vegas, which he said, I don't really want these pictures published. Mm. And so I said, Dad agreed to that at the time. He said, but everything else that you, that you have, I know you have pictures, they're, they're yours. So I had the world's largest archive of Michael Jackson photos in the world. Wow. And this is the pictures that you did. And I want to ask you, how many photos did you miss? How many moments did you miss? Can, miss? You, give me a, can you give me the idea about maybe some sort of like situation or something that happened that you wish you would capture, but you didn't have a camera or maybe something didn't work? I wish I'd kept a shot of him with Prince Charles and Princess Diana, which I didn't. I wish I still had the shot of the Osmonds and the Jackson 5, but I didn't have any film on the camera, so that's disturbing. But I don't think there's, there's not a moment that I can remember that we missed. I mean, I have shots of him with Elizabeth Taylor, Sophia Loren, uh, Baryshnikov, uh, dinner with, uh, dinner with Jackie Gleason in Miami. Hmm, the crabs was really good. Uh, stone crabs are great. Uh, and it was funny because Jackie Gleason, who you don't know, no to your Instagram fans, Jackie Gleason had a great show, this incredible show. He was a comedian for years and Michael, he did a movie called Gijo, I think, where he played a death mute clown or person. And Michael loved that movie. One of his favorites. And so when we were in Miami, Michael set up a dinner together. And Jackie Gleason said, you're so famous, why would you want to meet with an old guy like me? Because that picture really meant something to Michael. And so that really touched him, he was, he was touched. Think about three, the most iconic photos that you did in your career. In of Michael, career. or not Michael Jackson. Uh, shots of Elton John backstage. Then there's a great shot of him laying on the couch where he's asleep. And above him is a, is a sign. He's not asleep, but he's resting. And he's all dressed for the show. And above him is a sign that says, Welcome back, bitch. That's Elton John for that. Yeah. One second. Uh, probably with Elton again would be uh, John Lennon coming in for rehearsal. John came on the plane. We had a plane called the Starship. And John Lennon came on the plane, and Elton said, I want you to, when you're in Madison Square Garden, I want you to come on with us. And he goes, I'll only do it if whatever gets you through the night reaches number one. 
And they'll just say, that's your deal. If it gets to be number one, you'll come on the stage. You'll perform the show, the song. So it went to number one. Hmm. So we're in New York and uh, doing rehearsals. And she goes, we're going to do, I know two songs. That I, I, someone said there was four songs. I remember two songs. It was Loosing the Sky with Diamonds. And whatever gets you through the night. So, first day in rehearsal, John Lennon comes up in a blonde wig. Funny shot, funny shot. John Lennon there in a blonde wig, doing, playing the guitar, doing rehearsals with Elton. Second day he comes back, it's John Lennon wearing the cap. And so we're shooting, and the, I guess the New York promoter sent us by a bottle of uh, Rothschild, uh, what do you call it? Uh, a very expensive glass bottle of wine. Chateau de Rothschild, Chateau de Fille Rothschild. So it, this very expensive bottle of wine. And they had nothing to drink it out of except styrofoam cups, no paper cups. So there I got a great shot of Elton pouring the Chateau de Fille, Lafitte Rothschild into a paper cup. Hmm. And they were both drinking it. Then there, but just so many shots of them together, then the shots with the band, rehearsing it. That, that was one of the special evenings, very special. What about the third shot? What I go from Stevie to that? Probably the bad cover, but I have a really nice shot of him in yellow somewhere. We'll make it appear during our interview so people can see clearly. If you can find the picture for me, I can describe it. And this one, correct? So next to the bad shot, the bad cover, that's the shot we did. And I like it particularly because if you've seen it, let me look at it again. If you see it, you see it has a yellow shirt. Yes. So we're in this hotel and I went down to the flower shop downstairs and found purple irises, irises with yellow with the yellow in them. And I put them up on the mantelpiece because I knew he was gonna be wearing the yellow shirt. And then I dropped a few on the floor. So there's, you have the yellow and the purple and the yellow shirt ties it together. So that was one of the fun shots that we really set up. That's one I really like. Besides the shots in Japan, which were great, and the shots in Hong Kong, which were amazing. Other than that, that would be my favorite. This is your personal staged photos. Like you even dropped those flowers for a reason, right? On the floor. Yeah. How might I collect those photos? Loved it. But sometimes you just get lucky. Somebody asks, you know, what happened? How, how do you explain your career? Or so-called career? And I just say, you know, I was at the right place at the right time. So I'm, I'm, I'm out. The tours are over. The tours over. We're out traveling about. And I'm going into North Carolina to... Uh, by a house with my wife. So we're going to Carolina. I get a phone call from Michael. I need you to come back. But I'm in North Carolina. There's no tour. We're not doing a video. No, I'm going to do an interview with uh, Oprah to squash these allegations. Okay. And he says, I need you to light it. So, I mean, he has a videographer who travels with us all the time. But evidently, he trusted me more than him. So I said, but I'm in North Carolina. He goes, makes no difference. Get book a ticket. You're flying tomorrow. Yes, sir. So me and my wife flew back to L.A. And went up to, where was it? It had to be at San Inez. No, yeah, probably out to the ranch in San Inez. Sure, that's where, yeah, that's where we shot it. I never stayed there. Oof. Anyway, uh, so I set the lights for it. Oprah came in and did the interview. And then we did, Elizabeth Taylor was there. And then we did some, we did some playback. And so there's Michael, Elizabeth Taylor, and Oprah Winfrey. And this is in Life Magazine. Again, something your Instagram fans won't know anything about, but that's the way it was. What do you consider three top qualities of the celebrity photographer? Of successful celebrity photographer? 
I think it's a melding of a number of things. First, you have a modicum of degree of talent. I always dressed professionally, and you always were there on time. You were there, you did your job, you stayed in the background, you did, you did not become a point of attention. You were just there. You did your job, you arrived on time, you did your job, you looked good doing it, and you left. Uh, I was on a movie with a, a, a German actor called Bruno Ganz, who you probably don't know, but I was always really, he was in a movie called Wings of Desire, one of my favorite movies. So I'm on the set with, with Bruno, and Mr. Gans, and Bruno said, I like you. You are like old Hollywood. You come to the set, you're on time, clean shaven, you look good, you dress nice, you do your pictures, and then you go away. Nobody sees you. Being invisible is really important. You're old Hollywood. That's what I like about you. When you go away after the photo shoot, right now, nowadays, when you work with the celebrities, you need to have like a fast delivery. You need to edit the pictures or the videos, send it to the person so they can post it right away in the morning. Back in the days, you didn't have that. We don't do that. We never did that. That's your deal, not mine. I wouldn't, I don't like it. It's, you have people on Instagram who just want to be on Instagram. You have people with no talent posting pictures, and if you happen to mention, maybe you can do this to make your picture better, you have a, sca a thousand scathing reviews. I told one guy, I said, listen, why don't you change this to black and white and, and do the highlights, pull the highlights back a little bit. My response was, what do you know? You're old, you're irrelevant. <laughs> I said, I know maybe I'm irrelevant, but I do know something about photography. No, you don't. Nobody cares about what you did. Yeah, well, I'm making 300000 this year. What are you making shooting, posting pictures of your car in the parking lot? Are you happy with your career? Very. I mean, I think you have to be, considering that I started from some kid leaving the University of Alabama, going to uh, Los Angeles, knowing no one, knowing nothing about the business. And within two years, I'm shooting album cover. And then who did I travel with? Rod Stewart. I mean, so many bands that I've photographed. Great, great bands that, you know, people nowadays don't even know who they are. But wonderful photo, Mott the Hoople, a great photo studio, a group called the Chambers Brothers, which I'm so happy with. I mean, that was one of the first big ones. Jeff Beck, who was like an idol of mine, I got to photograph him in my studio. Hmm. Even though he arrived an hour late or an hour, two hours late, I didn't care. He was out buying parts for his 32, 32 Ford for back in England. He was out in the junkyard buying parts. Didn't bother, as long as he showed up, and I had this brilliant portrait of him. One of the, one of the pictures I'm pr proudest of. And so from that, I. I Get to travel with, with Earth, Wind, and Fire, Rod Stewart, Elton John, Fleetwood Mac, Michael Jackson for 10 years, and the last person I had toured with on a short tour was Miley Cyrus. Hmm. Then I realized it was probably, I should stick to movies. Do you think uh, the, all these names that you just mentioned, does these guys, they have their own personal icons that they're trying to follow e emulate yes like for example like Michael do you think he had his icon I don't think so I I don't I mean he admired James Brown I mean obviously because of the dancing so I think probably excuse me records of champions uh, I think maybe James Brown because of his dancing and it was really kind of funny because everybody thinks Michael started the moonwalk. Hmm. And I was watching a movie, and it, was a, it showed a, a, a band on stage, and they did the moonwalk a year before Michael did. <laughs> I'm going, wait a minute. So I think, you know, he, had, he always hired 
choreographers to work with him, some really great ones. And yeah, I think that, uh, I think maybe, maybe James Brown, I don't think Ray Charles, because uh, he, didn't, he didn't move on the stage. But I think probably if anyone that Michael admired the most would, be, would have been uh, James Brown. Sam, I should tell that I admire, admire your work. And this interview that I really wanted to do is just to, you know, highlight and show the people who sit on Instagram and they have no clue about, you know, the people like you, that older generation who did this amazing photos for us and thanks, thanks your work, we can, you know, witness this all greatness. Um, you need to show them the stuff with uh, those two guys. Oh my God, there is so many photos, no disrespect, so but there is so many photos so that... The, well, with, they might know Slash because he was Guns N' Roses. But the one you just showed was Steve Stevens, who was Billy Idol's guitarist. So Michael kind of liked the bad guys. Yes. So let's show them Mr. Slash. That's the next shot. I don't know if I have it here. It's you get your hand on it. This one. No, this is Steve Stevens. Put your hand back down where that one is. Oh, here. This one, yeah. So everybody... Your friends might know Slash, I mean, because he was with Guns N' Roses. Yes. I photographed him as a baby, because my girlfriend at the time knew, her mo knew his mother, so when he came over to my studio, we photographed him as a child. So I think Michael kind of liked the bad boys. So this is, yeah, this is the... <clears throat> Steve was on Dirty Diana, he played guitar on Dirty Diana. So this is a shot I did for the cover. And this is a picture of, of Mike and Steve Stevens on the back. And for some reason, I guess Diana was on bad because there's another one of my shots. It was your idea to do the shot of the, the boots? boots? Well, it certainly wasn't Michael's idea. No, I just saw him on the stage uh, or on the set and I saw these boots and I went, oh, that's kind of fun. So we had a great, we had a great collaboration. I mean, it was the first couple of tours. It was this great collaboration. It really was. Have you been friends with Michael Jackson, or you were just very professional and only business? I'm not sure. Michael had a lot of friends. That's may have been, that's really kind of sad. I think I had more friends than Michael Jackson. Michael had more admirers, more sycophants, people who wanted to be around him. I didn't really want to be around him. That wasn't, I just wanted to take great pictures. I didn't want to be your buddy. I like to be Elton's buddy. It was fun hanging out with Fleetwood Mac. But I didn't want to be Michael's buddy. So I feel like that's why he maybe like extra respected you for that. Because you haven't been, you were like keeping it very like business and professional. It was an artistic job. And it, for some reason, it just, it just kind of worked together. But, you know, toward the end, it got to be just a job. And at that point, I kind of, it wasn't fun anymore. Hmm. It became a paycheck. And once a job becomes just a paycheck and you're not creating anything, I know that sounds foolish, or not foolish, but self-aggrandizing or self-indulgent. But I liked creating, like, like just the shot of those boots. Where's the boots, yeah. That was just something you captured. The shots of him in Hong Kong on the boat that you created something. So you were creating, I don't want to sound art because then it makes you sound like you think you're some big deal. Mm -hmm. But you were creating something. And I did the same thing on the movie sets. Once you get to the movie set, you shut stuff off set and you created an image that wasn't really there. And I created something for him that wasn't really there. And once it becomes just shoot this, concert and I'll see you later I mean you take the paycheck but it becomes a job yes and you lose you lose enthusiasm for it what is the last 
moment that you had conversation with Michael? Probably somewhere in Mexico City. I think we'd already done the family honors. Or was that after Mexico City? You lose track. I'm really old and I drink a lot of champagne so I forget shit. Um, probably family honors. And that, and that was kind of at you were at a distance for that. It was just kind of being there and shooting it and shooting the concert and shooting that. And I think then I think probably Mexico was after that. And Mexico became, there was, all the accusations were coming down. And it became, for him, just became a job. Mm. It became a job for him, it became a job for him. You can see the enthusiasm is not there. And at that point, I felt the same thing. I mean, I'll shoot this, I'll shoot that, and then, eh, go home. Sam, I want to say thank you for this interview. It was amazing to talk to you. I'm very... I'm respecting you as the creator, as the artist, and thank you for everything that you left for us. And I hope this interview was very interesting for the people who didn't know those stories. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome. Appreciate it. Cut. Cut. Close shot on me drinking champagne at the end. That's good. <laughs>